our presenter is Mary Kelly Person. Where are you, Mary? There you go. Hi. Do you go by Mary Kelly or just Mary? Mary Kelly. Mary Kelly. Great. Got it. Uh, Mary Kelly earned her PhD in philosophy and worked as a romantic poetry scholar and teacher. She also earned a degree in law and has worked as a criminal, civil rights, and appellate lawyer. Mary describes herself as a civil rights, social justice, and, child's, and children's advocate. In 2016, she became the director of the Hannah Institute, which provides trauma-informed care training in Sonoma County and Northern California. Let me get my glasses. That's part of the problem here. The Hannah Institute's mission is to support parents and child-serving systems with resources that build resilience and hope. So Mary Kelly, thank you for being here, and we look forward to your presentation. We all like to think of childhood as this time of joy and innocence. But, I mean, for many of us, it's just not true. When you grow up in these type of situations, it's not something you, you talk about. I know I didn't. The first thing that we found is that adverse childhood experiences are common. They don't know what's going on. They won't remember anyway. Well, the child may not remember, but the body remembers. There was this incredible gee whiz effect. You, you mean adverse childhood experiences cause heart disease and lung disease and liver and cancer? Exposure to trauma affects children's developing brains. is on your behavior, it's on your heart, it's on your DNA, like how do you, how do you deal with all that? I don't reach out because I'm not used to that. We have a whole new body of knowledge now that could open up what we have up till now been seen as intractable, unsolvable problems. No child should be punched or kicked. No child should be punched or kicked. If you can get the science into the hands of the general population, they will invent very wise actions. Do you feel like any of the interventions have been making a difference? They've made all the difference in the world. It's there, it's possible, and a defeatist attitude is completely disconnected from what 21st century science is telling us. And we should be going after that like a bear. Good morning. Good morning. It's really such a privilege and an honor to be here. Um, I wanted to start out, I think I'm too close to the speaker. I'm going to go over here. I wanted to, um, to just start out by saying that because, uh, you know, I am not perhaps the person you expected to see today. I don't think I am. Um, I am not a clinician. I'm a teacher and a lawyer by training. Those are the audiences that I'm used to talking to. So I've actually never appeared before an audience of experts, <laughs> right? The, the position that I usually have as a speaker about ACEs and resilience is I consider myself to be an ambassador for the work that you do. So I, I'm feeling a little bit um, in between today. I'm gonna talk to you about um, you know, what I know to be the science of ACEs and resilience and the real hope that we see in the science and the research as it proceeds. Um, but just keep in mind that part of what you're seeing is what I go out and, and tell the world about what you do. Um, it's such incredibly valuable work, the work that you do with trauma. Um, and as a teacher and as a criminal defense attorney, um, I saw the story of ACEs right in front of me all the time. Um, and actually, that's why I do the work that I do. Um, but I'm not under any kind of impression that I'm a clinical expert. Um, so I, I'm a research translator. And I, this is such compelling work to me, such compelling research, that when I learned about it at first, um, from Nadine Burke Harris, whom you saw in, in the film, I felt I really had to get out there and talk about it. I want to take just a minute to read one passage from Nadine's new book, The Deepest Well, to explain why I called today's presentation by that name. Um, I suspect this is a story that many people know, but I just, I find it fascinating. There is a widely known parable that students all learn on day one in public health school, and it happens to be based on a true story. 
In late August 1854, there was a severe cholera outbreak in London. The Broad Street area in Soho was the epicenter with 127 dead in the first three days and more than 500 dead by the second week in September. Back then, the dominant theory was that diseases like cholera and bubonic plague were spread through unhealthy air. John Snow, a London physician, was skeptical of this miasma theory of disease. By canvassing the residents of the Broad Street neighborhood, he was able to deduce the pattern of the disease. Incidences were all clustered around a water source, a public well with a hand pump. When Snow convinced local officials to disable the well by removing the pump's handle, the outbreak subsided. At the time, no one wanted to accept Snow's hypothesis that the disease was spread not through the air, but by the more unpleasant fecal oral route. But a few decades later, science would catch up to him, and the miasma theory would be replaced by germ theory. As budding public health crusaders, my classmates and I focused on the sexy part of the parable of the well, the bit where snow topples the miasma theory. But I also took away a larger lesson. If 100 people all drink from the same well and 98 of them develop diarrhea, I can write prescription after prescription for antibiotics. Or I can stop and ask, what the hell is in that well? So that explains the title of Nadine Mercaris's book. I think that some of you um, might be joining us next week at Hannah Institute for her reading. A couple of people. So yeah, looking forward to seeing you there. She's coming out to talk about, about the book. Um, Nadine has a very medical pediatric view of ACEs. She's you know, at the Center for Youth Wellness. She advocates for screening and treatment for ACEs. Um, not exactly the work that you do, but she viewed that deepest well experience as a real aha moment for ACEs. If you're seeing children who are all experiencing, exhibiting the same types of trauma symptomatology, do you keep treating the kids or do you stand up on the rooftop and say, we have a public health crisis and this is how it has to be addressed, it's how it has to be understood, it's how it has to be nationally approached. I think it makes a lot of sense to us, particularly in the wake of recent gun, sh um, gun violence, to think about it this way. So here, I put that clicker down. I just called it a clicker. It sounds like something my grandpa would have said. Let me grab that. <laughs> Where's the clicker? All right, here it is. Um, Bessel van der Kolk, who I think all of you um, know, said trauma lodges in the body and emotions and not in words, which is a key insight of the ACE of science, that the, it's not all in your head, right? <laughs> it really, truly isn't. So these are some of the things that um, I wanted to look at with you today. Um, what are ACEs? What did the data show about ACEs in California and Sonoma County? Um, what do we know about the prevalence of ACEs among criminal defendants and persons sub suffering from substance abuse? How about among foster children? What do we know about generational trauma? Um, what is trauma-informed care? Um, how might you benefit from learning about trauma-informed care if you don't already know about it? And that's kind of a funny question, right? Kind of goes back to what I said in the beginning. Not sure that question has much relevance for this audience, but, um, and then how can Hannah Institute help? Like, what do we offer? What are, what are we doing out there over in Sonoma? So Nadine Burke-Harris, um, one of the leading researchers and speakers of a science nationally, has said, the scope of the issue is huge. It's massive. It's a public health crisis, and it's been largely unrecognized. Now, in this room, I could believe that there'd be a certain amount of skepticism about that. I think you probably have known about this for a couple decades, right, since the study came out. But I think in the broader in the broader um, American landscape of understanding of public health, I think it's a true statement. So average childhood experiences are exposure suffered by kids when they're younger than 18. Um, and as I think is widely know known now, the ACEs were first identified and described and measured in a 1995 to 1997 study done by Kaiser Permanente in San Diego in cooperation with the Centers for Disease Control. Um, the cohort was 17,000 people. It's a very sizable cohort that was studied there, um, mostly Caucasian, mostly with at least some college education. Um, and so when that study was done, and the study actually originated in, I believe it was Jack Folletti's um, he looked at a lot of his people, a lot of his patients who suffered from obesity, and found that when he 
question them more thoroughly. As it turned out, many of them had suffered sexual trauma as children. And that was a, kind of the seed of why they wanted to study retrospectively what the experiences of the cohort may have been in childhood. So at the end of the study, the categories of adverse childhood experiences that were measured were abuse, that's emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, emotional neglect, physical neglect, and household challenges. Mother was treated violently. There was household substance abuse, household mental illness, parental separation or divorce, or an incarcerated household member. I want to pause just for a moment on the incarcerated household member item, both because of my criminal defense background, but also because we now imprison, as a proportion of our population, more people than any other country in the world. Um, anybody know the rough figure for incarcerated individuals in the United States? I, I, I don't know the percent, but that could be number-wise. Anybody know? 2.2 million people. That includes federal prison and state and county jails. 2.2 million people. So if we ponder the fact that having an incarcerated household member, a parent, the impact of that experience on a child, and the fact that we can document that as an adverse childhood experience that potentially has lifelong health impact, and certainly does in the public health context, it gives another kind of layer to our discussion about mass incarceration that's really important for people like you to know about and to talk about because of the work that you do. So in the original ACES study, I realized that somehow I dropped out the slide that had the rough results. So 26% had one ACE, 16% had two, 10% had three, 12.5% had four or more ACEs. So the, the basic finding from the ACE study was really that ACEs are very prevalent. And ACEs are everywhere. Right? So, you know, there's no way to say, oh, ACEs lodge in, you know, parts of the community that are poorer, or there's no way to identify ACEs with any particular population, though there are some populations that are at greater risk. ACEs are everywhere. When unbuffered and untreated, ACEs can, um, exposure to ACEs has short and long-term health effects. And again, an, a really important finding there is that the effects aren't just on mental and emotional health. Their physical health impacts that across the population, if unbuffered, have incredibly big impact. So the examples that I give people first are the ones that surprise no one, right? So depression, substance abuse, suicidality, okay, we get that. But then you get to asthma <laughs> in children, especially, right? You get to cardiopulmonary obstructive disease. You get to cancer. And then it becomes very interesting. So how is it that seven of the 10 leading causes of death, leading causes of morbidity and mortality in the United States, how is it that seven of 10 of them have been positively linked to adverse childhood experiences? We're talking about it now, but for a long time, this kind of an amazing, huge discovery was very quiet. I think you've probably seen this before. I show this to people when I talk to my accustomed audiences of teachers and lawyers, and sometimes you hear a gasp, actually, because it's so significant. Um, the one that pops out for everyone first, of course, is have you ever attempted suicide? What's the risk factor for four or more ACEs? 12.2 times the risk of attempting suicide if you have experienced four or more ACEs. That's a crisis. And it, it's, it's just such an incredibly big effect here. Ever injected drugs, you have over a 10% increased risk of that. Consider yourself an alcoholic, 7.4x. So these are the risk factors, the behavioral choices that come from ACEs that, that are risky. But look at the disease conditions above. Chronic bronchitis or emphysema, 3.9x with four ACEs. Stroke, 2.4x. Ischemic heart disease, 2.2x. Any cancer, 1.9. There's some massive effects, right? And the thing is, like having four or more ACEs is not that rare. The lifetime impact of ACEs exposure can be massive. So we know that the leading causes of mortality and morbidity are related to social determinants of health and lifestyle factors, and ACEs are a big contributor. And kids don't just get over it. So, I, you know, when I was a kid and my family was going through rough times and my brother was in therapy, you heard this all the time. 
oh, kids, they get over it, they'll be fine. I mean, you of all people know how that is, how irresponsible that is, right, to say that about a child. That's just not reality. Left untreated ACEs really do have a lifetime impact. This is the part that I always add right here, because by right about now, people are getting down, <laughs> right? Okay, ACEs are really prevalent, they're these really awful things, they kill people, this is terrible, this is, you know, what are we gonna do? Resilience science is growing by leaps and bounds, and I bet you also know that. Uh, we learn more every day about how to prevent and buffer ACEs and how to reduce intergenerational transmission as well. I know that's gonna sound idealistic in this room. Um, when I talk to you know, teachers and lawyers, I really try to put that across as an important idea because they can have an impact on intergenerational transmission where they are, in their law rooms, in their courtrooms, in their classrooms. Um, I wanted to point out that we have in the room a great friend of Hannah Institute, Lynn Haley over there, Hello, Lynn. Um, Lynn is working, um, to, speaking of resilience science, and I'm not sure that Lynn would characterize what she's doing at Sonoma Charter as resilience science, but certainly it's play therapy, and um, it, we do a therapy called Rainbow Dance over at Sonoma Charter, and then Lynn works with some of the children who are involved in that therapy at the school. So if that sounds intriguing, please talk to Lynn about it afterwards. It's really good to see you. So this pyramid, I think, is also uh, pretty well known at this point. So this is how adverse childhood experiences affect the life course, the, the pyramidal progression of it. So adverse childhood experiences lead to disrupted neuro neurodevelopment, social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, adoption of health risk behaviors, disease, disability, and social problems, early death. Right, so this is not destiny. Right, so this is also the part where you Look people in the eye and you say, okay, you have a high A score. It's not destiny. This is not your destiny. This is not your fate. There are so many things that we can do to buffer, to even reverse the effects of ACEs. But it's so important to know that this is the public health impact that we see of ACEs over the life course. Um, I don't have with me, but would like to tell you about an, a revision of this pyramid that has added below here, below and prior to adverse childhood experiences, experiences like historical and social and racial trauma. Um, this is a, a, a study that's being done um, in the East Bay by a collective called RISE. What they're looking at is what happens in the DNA almost, in the epigenetics of children who come from you know, come from cultures, ethnicities, backgrounds, where that kind of trauma pre-exists and is, is there in in their background, essentially, in their history, before we get to the adverse childhood experiences. That's an incredibly important area of study that's growing now. I'm gonna talk about it a little more in a minute. Um, but it's important to recall that adverse childhood experiences, for many, don't just, well, perhaps for no one, pop up out of nowhere. What about trauma and adversity other than ACEs? Because, you know, ACEs, 10 identifiable, big exposures that occur within the four walls of a house. But we know that that's not the only trauma our kids face, right? So in Sonoma Valley, the, um, one of the factors that I think of first um, working out there at, at Hannah Boy Center and near the Springs is the deportation threat stress that we see. Um, and I'm hearing a lot of agreement in the room. We know that this is present and it hasn't gone away. It hasn't gotten less. And we're very concerned about it because it has such an impact on increasing the stress level for the families, but especially for the kids. Um, we know, of course we know, you better than anyone, what kind of traumatic stress the fires caused all over the county and not only in the most effect affected areas. So those are types of trauma that um, certainly should not, we shouldn't lose track of that in, in the midst of thinking about within the four walls trauma that we see. So there's lots of other adversities that um, can be very harmful in similar ways to kids and that they have been studied. Exposure to community violence. So this is a big one. I, I live in San Francisco, which is where I was born. Um, I live sort of in the, the hate area, um, but I have connections to a number of organizations in the Bayview-Hunters Point area, which historically has been an area of the city that has experienced more poverty and, and more community violence, along with being an incredibly, incredibly strong community. So I don't know how many people up here heard about the Mario Woods shooting that happened. Um, this was a, a young man who was in distress and was carrying a knife and was um, killed by police in a, 
I think there were about 10 officers. Um, and that was a horrible tragedy. The part that not everybody picked up on was the video that was circulated of Mr. Woods dying was taken by middle school students in a bus that was parked there. <coughs> so what does that do to a child to see that, to record it, to have it in your head, right? So when we talk about community violence, for people like you who treat trauma, that's a very immediate impact to the clients you treat and especially the kids. And it's something that I really hope we become a lot more aware of in studying average childhood experiences and their impact. Um, bullying, homelessness, parental stress, of course, economic hardship and poverty. Um, something else that we see a lot of in the Springs area but does not compute for a lot of people when thinking about Sonoma County, right? But we have remarkable disparity that puts a lot of pressure on a lot of our families. Um, and of course, discrimination. There's a new set of research coming out now out of Philadelphia, mainly. This is the research that I'm following. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with this line of research. I see a couple nods. This is incredibly fascinating. It's done by a pediatrician called Roy Wade. He's at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Um, he told me on the phone that he would come out. So I don't have a date for him yet, but he's going to come and talk to us. And I hope a bunch of you will come because the research that he's doing is so incredibly important. Um, you recall that the cohort for the original study was um, 17,000 mostly Caucasian folks, mostly with some college education. Rory wanted to understand what ACEs looked like for other populations that were more representative of the United States. His study cohort is 43% African American, 44% white, and 42% had no more than a high school diploma. Here's what he found. Traditional ACEs occurred at a somewhat higher rate. I should have put somewhat in there because it really was pretty similar. 65% um, of the participants experienced at least one of the original ACEs. Um, what Roy called urban ACEs he re measured as well, and they were also prevalent, um, including experiencing racism, witnessing violence, living in an unsafe neighborhood, living in foster care, and being bullied. Here's what he found. So overall, nearly 58% experienced at least one urban indicator, at least one urban ACE. 81% experienced at least one original or, or, or urban ACE, so one or the other. 45%, if you think about the Venn diagram, 45% experienced at least one of each. 37% reported four or more ACEs. The Kaiser CDC number was 12.5%. But look at this. 14% experienced at least one urban ACE, but zero traditional ACEs. They would have fallen right out of the original study. So I think that what Roy is doing is incredibly important for expanding our understanding of what adverse childhood experience is, who it impacts, and how. Um, I recommend this. I, actually, if anyone wants to know more about this, if you want to email me or email the Institute, I'd be happy to, to share the information with you. Um, and certainly, when Roy comes to visit, um, I, will, I will let you know. How do ACEs work? So some of the questions you get from people um, who are not professionals will be something like, so when my kid gets stressed out, are you telling me you know, he's going to get asthma? It's like, well, no. I mean. Stress is positive, right? I mean, a lot of stress that we experience is positive. Um, it's not problematic on its own. I mean, you have to stress a system in order to get positive development. You all know that. It's the toxic stress that never lets up, the, the bear that's always outside the door. That toxic stress can disrupt the body's neuroendocrine system, and that ultimately damages the body. So the key point is that toxic stress triggers a biological phenomenon. Um, as Robert Macy, our partner at International Trauma Center, says, the issue is in the tissue. Nice little saying. You know? <laughs> the issue is in the tissue. And I think that's important, too, because it's so easy to conclude that with emotional upset, that emotional upset stays in the brain. And it's so clear to us now that it doesn't, even though for a while, quite a while, I think, we didn't really understand what the pathway was, right? We understood that there was adverse childhood experiences that were correlated with health outcomes later in life, but why? 
So the toxic stress pathway um, is the product and part of recent research that has looked at constant activation of stress pathways in the body as preventing homeostasis and leading to a chronic stress response. You can never like regulate, you can never return back to neutral if that stress is a constant presence outside your door. This stress response diagram is actually from an article by the Center for Youth Wellness. I apologize that I did not reproduce the reference on this slide, but again, if you'd like the article, I would be happy to send it to you if you'd like to email me. This was from an article that was published by the Center for Youth Wellness researchers in 2016 about what they, what they had been discovering about the way that toxic stress actually works in the body. So positive stress is the physiological response to a mild or a moderate stressor, right? So you have a brief elevation of the stress response, you elevate your heart rate and your blood pressure, and then you return to normal. You go back to homeostasis. That's a tough test at school or a playoff game or what I'm doing right now for me, <laughs> right? My blood pressure's up, I'm a little nervous, you know. Y'all are experts and I'm kind of feeling silly talking to you, so I'm a little nervous, but it'll be okay. Um, tolerable stress is adaptive, like that's an adaptive response to time limited stressors. Um, do you, sorry, if you comment? Oh, we were, yeah, we were talking about you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> she said you were doing great, and I'm thinking, not experts as much as compassionate caregivers. You are compassionate caregivers. We, I am such an admirer of the work that you do because I read about it, and I can't imagine, like, it's such an amazing job to do day after day to stand up as in your shoes and do what you do, it's amazing. So um, thank you. So the tolerable stress is that adaptive response to a time-limited stressor, right? So that homeostasis is recovered by buffering the effect with a caring adult or another intervention. So here, obviously, we're talking about a kid. Um, so Nadine Burke Harris has often said, I've heard her often say, that the number one factor in a kid adequately buffering stress is a caring adult. Um, and that could be mom, it could be dad, it could be aunt, it could be cousin, grandma, teacher, coach. I mean, you know, you know the litany. But that attachment relationship to a stable adult when you go through this type of stress is one of the most important factors and maybe the most important one. Toxic stress is what we're really worried about. So that's the maladaptive response, and that's an intense and it's a sustained stressor. So prolonged activation of stress response that disrupts the brain architecture and increases the risk of health disorders. That's prolonged allostasis and it establishes a chronic stress response. Abuse, neglect, household dysfunction. But again, what I also really want us to consider is the kinds of chronic stresses that the kids encounter outside the four walls of their house. When you walk out of the house and you don't know what you're going to see. When you walk out of the house and you don't know if you're gonna get anything else to eat that day. Those are, are added on and I think really warrant continued research in the years to come. So what do we know about ACEs in California and Sonoma County? So California actively participates in collecting ACEs data collection and researching it. So we're lucky to have that, that right research. Um, California Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System is an acronym I never remember. I usually call it BRFUS. Um, but but this, uh, this is a, a way to, um, the federal government collects data developed by the CDC in 1984, um, and it's data across 50 states, and it's by telephone survey. So eventually an ACEs module was developed and added to better collect this data. Is, um, I just wanted to point out real quickly that this module is retrospective, so that means it asks adults about experiences they had in childhood. That's no different from the CDC Kaiser study, it's the same thing, so you're asking adults which of these stress experiences did you have when you were a kid? California was the first and only state to include the ACEs module in 2008. Um, later it was included in 9, 11, and 13. Um, I go to Kansas, um, at this point I go to Kansas once a year. It's a, a really interesting state um, and we go, I go out there to talk about ACEs um, with judges and lawyers. Um, and Kansas has also included the module. Um, and so, for example, they're one of the states that added later than California, but each, each time this is done, a few more states join in. This is again data that's taken, or um, slides that are taken from a Center for Youth Wellness report that was published in 2014 about the data that had been collected up to that date. So in California, 61.7% of adults have experienced at least one 
and one in six or 16.7% have experienced four or more. The most common ACE among California adults is emotional or verbal abuse. Um, and I'm really curious to know whether that mirrors what you see in your practices. Does that, does this surprise you or does it make sense? Make sense? I would have to say our practice is a little skewed because we get the people that are in trouble. <laughs> right, right, right. But I mean, in terms of the kinds of trouble they're articulating to you, is that the most common type that you might hear of? Sexual abuse? When you say uh, like exposure to four or more ACEs, when you say exposure to four or more ACEs, is that in the... Turn it on is uh, when you say exposure to four, say four or more ACEs, is that individual incidents of abuse, for instance, or is that a category? That's a great question. So that, and that gets asked all the time. And, and in order to like, give you a really, really quality response, I'd need Nadine here, Kent Chandler, unfortunately. Um, I know the way that it works in the data collection is it's by incident. So if you ha go through one incident of sexual trauma, you have that adverse childhood experience. If you go through 10, you have the same number. I believe that's because epidemiologically, there's not a distinction in terms of frequency with the disease risk. Um, but there is evidence, I mean, we do know that the trauma and the, ex the, um, the effect of the trauma does layer, it accumulates. Um, there's more questions. I'm curious about the um, collection data. When Kaiser did it, these are patients that are part of the Kaiser system. Mm -hmm. So they're already, <clears throat> excuse me. Hello, yes. Um, when, when the Kaiser study was done, it was done as part of the collection system for patients that were coming in regularly on, they were already part of a system where the, it was covered. The telephone survey is gonna be self-selecting because that means there are people who won't answer the phone or who choose mm -hmm. not to, you know, people who could give important information. And nowadays people are very, you know, very guarded about what they're willing to give over the phone. So I'm curious to know, I would, I've always thought Kaiser was actually a little low because these are people who have covered medical care and often some of the highest ACE scores are from people who don't. So I'm just curious whether they're considering that factor when they're collecting the data. I think that's an excellent question and I don't know the answer. Um, what I would say is I, I would suspect if anything this undercounts for exactly the reason that you stated and because a lot of people who have say an A score of eight or nine may not even be functional enough to really kind of put it all together, right? So I think this should be taken with some salt, <laughs> but if anything, to be low and not high. I think that's a really good point. One of the things I was noticing, because I looked at ACEs before, uh, one of the things they've left out, and I know they're investigating putting it in, is there's no demographic for LGBT of any kind. And LGBT have much, much higher abuse on all levels across the board. Could I ask a question back? about that? Yes. So how would you uh, want to see that measured? What would be the question that you would ask? Actually, a lot of people will actually answer those questions if they're asked, are you LGBT? And unfortunately, they're not asked in the, ACE, in the ACEs. So would you, I guess what I'm getting at is, would you regard LGBT identity as, that, that's not in it's and of itself an ACE, but. It's critical for the demographics for the ACEs. As you slice it to understand the, the risk factor. Yeah, yes. yeah, understood, yeah. Yeah. Fact, say for instance, for, oh, not, I'm sorry, I thought it was, I was hearing my voice. The fact is for ACEs, uh, I mean for demographics, take for instance a transgender individual, they're 10 times more likely to be abused on all levels. If you're LGB, four, four to six times more likely depending on where you live in the country. Mm -hmm. So it's very, it's vital that ACEs start collecting that data. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. a great point. Thank very you. Very definitely. Anybody else at the moment? No. So, um, as we said, emotional or verbal abuse is the number one reported. Um, parental separation or divorce, two, substance abuse, three, physical abuse, four, and on. Um, so that's, that's specific to California. You can literally see the hot spots in the state on this map. So the darker red the county, the more ACE exposure. I, I find this fascinating myself, actually, because 
you know, the Sonoma actually, I mean, I, I, it's hard for me to parse exactly the color, but I think Sonoma um, is at 65 to 70, which is a little bit elevated over the Kaiser CDC number. But, you know, we've got Mendocino, a real hot spot. And then you have Santa Clara County, where I grew up, which is, seems to be doing fine. So again, you know, this, this is interesting in that you have the bias of the person reporting, right? This is what you were talking about. The, the bias of the person reporting their own ACEs and the bias that's included in, in how you ask the question and to whom and how you get the data. But all of that said, assuming that this is a rough approximation, it's a pretty interesting map. Mm -hmm. This is... Yes. And I think that was, that's another thing. Yeah. A lot of the counties were rural, and I think that's a whole other... I mean, there's so many demographics mm -hmm. that I hope will eventually be looked at in terms of this, because I think that's a whole issue, too, just in general, mm -hmm. around rural communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. Um, some of the stresses that happen there. But I noticed that on that map, Mendo, Humboldt, um, and then, you know, the ones that are in the Sierras. Mm -hmm. It'd be interesting to take that map and slice it a couple of different ways, right? By rural, but also, if, so you look at, okay, so can we figure out what's going on in rural counties that's different? By urban counties, if you look at San Francisco County or, or Cocoa, um, all right, so if we add in those other indicators, like the ones that Roy Wade is studying, what do we see about those and how does that impact the ACE profile for that county? There's just so much more work to be done with big data people. I, Completely agree. Did you have a question or a comment? No, okay. Um, this is uh, the, you know, we have a pretty limited demographic slicing of this data. Admittedly, this is, you know, what we have from this particular measurement. So the risk of um, ACE exposure um, is roughly equivalent for white folks and African American folks, somewhat elevated for Hispanic or Latinx populations. But again, remember, this is measuring within the four walls of the house. And I think that's, it's so important to keep that in mind when looking at this. This is so small, I really don't think anyone is gonna be able to read it. I'm sorry, I didn't, like my genius sense did not kick in when I made this slide. So I'll tell you what it says. So a person with four or more aces, I, you know, this is, we, we went over this a bit. So 12 point times is likely to attempt suicide. Um, 10.3 times is likely to use injection drugs. 7.4 times is likely to be an alcoholic. A person with four or more ACEs is 2.2 times as likely to have ischemic heart disease, 2.4 times as likely to have a stroke, 1.9 times as likely to have cancer, 1.6 times as likely to have diabetes. And 21% more likely to be below 250% of the federal poverty level, 27% more likely to have less than a college degree, 39% more likely to be unemployed. I doubt that last one surprises you because I suspect that in your practices you see a good number of people who can't function well enough to be employed. All of this said, I will just tell you that according to all of these studies, I'm actually supposed to be dead 20 years early. I don't buy it. <laughs> I think, you know, it is, again, just really important to remember this is a public health analysis. It's a population level study. It doesn't communicate to any one person what their own destiny will be. But as a public health tool, it's incredibly powerful. So for the first time in 2011-2012, the National Survey of Children's Health provided a profile of ACEs among children 0 to 17. Now, I tried to figure out exactly how they collected this data, and I haven't been able to find it yet. I don't, you know... I imagine that, well, like, there's two possibilities, right? I mean, it could be parentally reported, or perhaps for teenagers, they asked the kids. Ain't no way they asked a two-month-old and got an answer, right? So I'm just, I'm not exactly sure how seriously we should take these findings right now, but this is an area that's being worked on. Because one of the things, of course, about ACEs data is, it's retrospective. Right? You ask people at, you know, who are adults about their childhood. We're not asking kids about their experience. 44.3% of California's kids have had one or more adverse experiences, 18.2% two or more. Um, among the kids 6 to 17, 50% have experienced ACEs. Um, we know that California, this is again not shocking, California kids who have experienced ACEs are less engaged in school, more likely to repeat grades, but building resilience in kids makes a huge difference. Um, and this is done by the, um, the Data Center for Child and Adolescent Health. 
These numbers are low, by the way, if you compare them, as you know, to the CDC Kaiser study. So the question mark there is, again, how is it being asked? How is it being reported? Who's doing the answering? We don't have a lot of data for ACEs in Sonoma County yet because that level of slicing has just not been going on for very long. So you'll see low number of events here that make it such that we can't really interpret. I, I would be hesitant to draw conclusions from this anyway because the confidence interval is not terrific. We just don't have enough historical data collection yet. But if this is reliable to some degree, you can see that Sonoma County has a higher risk of ACEs exposure at the four plus level than you would expect to see given the Kaiser study. It's 21.6 um, as opposed to 12.5. So I think I mentioned to you um, that I was a practicing attorney um, before I took this job at HANA. And one of the biggest reasons why I chose to do this work is because of my street crime defendants. There is not one of them that I ever represented that had an ACE score less than, I would say, eight. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't know about the ACE of science at the time. Obviously, I didn't ask them the questions, but just from the story, their story that they told me, I could see that. Um, if you'll give me a minute, I want to tell you about Christopher Puckett. Everybody, good. So um, Chris is someone who I will absolutely never forget. He was a huge influence on my life. Chris um, grew up in East Palo Alto. Anybody know about East Palo Alto? Yeah, so East Palo Alto is the part of Palo Alto that got cut off from Palo Alto by the highway as a segregation, let's just be honest, intentional segregation, really, of that part of the city. So in East Palo Alto, it's a very low opportunity area, um, very dangerous for kids. So what Chris grew up in EPA, um, by his report to me, he didn't know people who had jobs where you went to a job every day. He knew people who supported their families by selling drugs. Chris got along by selling little bags of drugs. He was never violent, but he was a victim of violence more than once. Um, by the time I represented him, he had been through the state juvenile, ju not, not juvenile justice, the justice system, and had finally been federalized, which is what happens when the FBI gets tired of you and sends you up to the Northern District of California, which is where I encountered him as part of the Criminal Justice Act referral system, where judges assign a person a lawyer if they can't afford one. So Chris was facing a lot of years because of our minimum sentencing law, because of the way that it looks at drug quantities. And there was at the time, this was 2011, I don't know if anybody remembers or why you would have noticed that there was a Fair Sentencing Act that was passed that tried to bring back in line the sentencing consequences for crack cocaine and powder cocaine, which are clearly identified racially with white people and black people. We all know this, right? And so it was an attempt to bring the sentencing back in line. It didn't do the job, right? It went from 100 to 1 to 18.6 to 1, but it was something, and it would have made a big difference for Chris. Chris you have to put yourself in my shoes here, right? Chris did not graduate from high school. Chris finds out about the Fair Sentencing Act. I go see him in lockup. He says, tell me about this Fair Sentencing Act. I'll give you the statute. So I gave him the statute. He wanted to read the opinion. So I brought him the judicial opinions in lockup and I came back next time and he's looking at him and he's talking about these judicial opinions with me. And I thought it was amazing and I was so angry because Chris should have been a lawyer, you see. Why was he there and not sitting next to me? Because that should have been his fate. Chris, as it turns out, made us take his case all the way through the rungs of the Department of Justice in the Northern District of California. We got up to the criminal chief. Ultimately, a judicial decision made out in DC showed that Chris was right, y'all. He was right. He read those opinions and he got it. The Fair Sentencing Act applied to his case and he got a lower sentence. So I went to see him in lockup again before he got sentenced and I looked at him and I said, Chris, go to college when you get out. And he looked at me like I had six heads. How could he have heard that from his experience? And yet that should have been his reality. So he went in, he came back out. And the next thing that I heard about Christopher Puckett was when my colleague called me in July of 2016 to tell me that she'd run into the judge that had sentenced Chris who told her that Chris had been riding his bike home from watching a football game. He was going back to his kids and he got shot dead on an East Palo Alto street. And that was how Chris's life ended. And it broke my heart 
Because I can't look at Chris and I can't look at my other defendants and not see their stories as Ace's stories. Right? Through and through. And so Chris's life was a tragedy in its ending, but I will never forget him. And I'll never stop being angry that he wasn't trying cases with me instead of spending time in a prison. And so I think when you look at the question of ACEs and you think about our kids who start getting involved with the juvenile justice system and they've got that ACEs in their background, I think it's up to us, it's up to you as therapists doing the work that you do to communicate about this and the need that we have to better treat criminal defendants, especially our kids, in this light. <laughs>